Oh, well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be with you this morning. Hi. Um, so last week, let me get my stuff out a second. Uh, last week, Chris kicked off a series for us for Lent, um, looking at what might it look like if, if Jesus asked us to give up something for Lent. You know, it's kind of a tradition to give up something for Lent, and often we give up things like chocolate or Facebook or sugar or things like that, but we tend to have kind of ulterior motives when we do this. I know one year I gave up chocolate and I thought, you know, I'd like to lose five pounds and maybe if I just stopped eating chocolate for 40 days, that would do the trick. It didn't work. I ate chocolate anyway. And <laughs> but that's, we tend to do these things with our giving up things for Lent. So we thought we'd take a step back during these Sundays of Lent and look at what might Christ really want us to give up this year. So last week, Chris talked about giving up ourselves, giving up our me addiction, that addiction to ourselves. And today I want to look at what would it look like if we gave up our fear. And to help us look at that this morning, I want to read the story of Jesus walking on water. Um, I love that ocean song, and what a fitting song for this morning when we are called into the oceans. So turn with me, if you can, um, to Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. Um, do we have it on the screens? Yeah. New thing. Scripture on the screens. Here we go. So Matthew 14 says, Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from the land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, Jesus said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. And those who were in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Will you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for these words from the Gospel of Matthew. And we ask that you teach us from them. Teach us more about who we are and who you are. And let us be changed as we leave this place this morning. In your name we pray. Amen. So I grew up in a Christian home, and I grew up going to Sunday school and all that good stuff. So this is one of those stories I heard a lot. And I think I kind of got desensitized to it. Yeah, okay, Jesus walked on water. Of course, he's Jesus. He can do that stuff. But I never really took a step back to think about, especially what Peter might have experienced in this moment. If you can picture, they're out on this, this large lake or sea, depending on your translation, this big body of water in this little fishing boat, and the winds have risen up, and the waves are getting higher. You can imagine that in itself would be a little bit scary, to be out on that water. And then all of a sudden, one of the disciples looks up, and he sees this strange figure out in the distance. It almost looks like a person. And they say the only logical thing they can think of, but there's a ghost. I can see a ghost out there. And of course, they all cry out in fear. I would too if I thought I saw a ghost. It almost sounds like a pirate's tale. You know, when the winds get high and the waves rise up, then you see the black sails of the black pearl out in the distance or something. <laughs> but they saw this figure and cried out that it was a ghost. And it says in the scripture that Jesus immediately says, take courage. Don't be afraid, it's me. Right away, he tells them, don't be afraid. It's not a ghost at all. It's Jesus. It's their rabbi. It's their friend. And I want to pause here because this is such a meaningful moment. Those simple words of Jesus are actually really profound if you stop and dig into them. Jesus is doing so much more than a cool party trick here. It would be really cool to be able to walk on water, right? But he's, he's doing something so profound and rife with meaning that no wonder the disciples at the end say, surely you are the son of God. 
So first of all, if you are a really good listener and have an incredible memory, you might remember me talking about this before. But water in scripture is used a lot as a symbol. And I don't say that to say that this story isn't true, but I think Jesus was using this symbol to make a point to his disciples. Maybe you remember me saying this, but water in Old Testament times, especially big bodies of water like lakes or seas or oceans, were symbols of chaos. And if you think about it, you know, we have ocean liners and we have kayaks you can take around Orcas Island and we can do things that are fun on the ocean. You know, you can go down to Golden Gardens to the Puget Sound and take out a kayak and have a great time. Or for us, sometimes the ocean and the water is a commodity, something that that we can use for trade. You see the big container ships taking our Japanese and German cars over here so we can buy them and drive them to church in the morning. And we can, we can use it for trade. It's something we've kind of conquered today, isn't it? With big ships and cruises and all kinds of fun things to do on the ocean or ways to trade on the ocean. But if you think about in Jesus' day or in the Old Testament even, it was kind of unruly, this water. They had these little boats, and it was unpredictable when a storm might come. They didn't have meteorologists to tell you about Arctic freezes and those kinds of things. It was this unpredictable, unruly, chaotic thing. So for the life and time of people then, the water represented chaos. So first of all, when Jesus came and walked on the water, he was literally walking on chaos. He was actually stepping underfoot everything that was unpredictable and unruly in the minds of the disciples. That's a really meaningful action, isn't it? That's more than just, hey, look what I can do. I'm Jesus. I can walk on water. It's, it's a very meaningful, profound moment in Jesus' life and ministry to walk on top of chaos. So when he says to the disciples, take courage, don't be afraid, it's more than just, guys, I'm not a ghost, don't be scared. He's saying, take courage because I am the one who can actually walk on your chaos. Even when the wind is high and the waves are buffeting the boat, as it says in scripture, Jesus can walk on that chaos. What an incredibly meaningful thing for Jesus to do. But believe it or not, in that one simple sentence of Jesus, there's even more profoundness, profundity. Is that the word? There's even more, <laughs> there's even more depth. When Jesus says, take heart, it's me, or in some Bibles it says, it is I. In the Greek, what he says is ego a me, like let go of my ego, right? Ego a me, <laughs> which literally translated is I am. Bible scholars among us might recognize that phrase, I am. It goes back to Exodus 3, when Moses had just seen the burning bush, and he heard the call to go to Egypt, and Moses is kind of resisting, saying, who am I that I should go? And at one point he says, well, okay, if I go and they ask me who sent me, what am I supposed to say? You don't have a name, God. And God says, tell them I am who I am. Tell them the I am has sent you. In Hebrew, that's Yahweh. That's the name for God. We're first given a name for God in that moment. In Greek, it's ego eimi, I am. So Jesus comes and identifies himself with that proper name for God. He says, don't be afraid. It's me, the great I am, walking on your chaos. You don't have to be afraid. There's all this profound meaning in there is so much deeper so much so much more profound than jesus saying simply it's me he's saying don't be afraid i am the great i am and i am lord even over chaos so it's no wonder at the end the disciples worship him and say surely you are the son of god Instead of being confused, as the disciples often are, <laughs> they finally get it, and they worship at Jesus' feet. Jesus is the one who walks on chaos as the great I am. And then enters Peter. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I've heard this story, Peter kind of, be kind of 
kind of becomes this bumbling, unfaithful guy. You know, he doesn't even have the faith to walk on water, but I don't know that I would have the faith to walk on water either. That's kind of a crazy thing to think you can do. So I want to come out a little bit in defense of Peter this morning. And if you look carefully, Peter asked Jesus to have him come out and walk with him. It doesn't seem like, if you look closely at the story, it doesn't seem like Jesus had any intention of ever asking anyone else to walk on water. He was doing this to show his power over chaos and to say that he is the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But Peter wants to join him. How faithful is that? Peter asks to join Jesus in this powerful, profound moment. So Jesus simply says, come. And what's so cool is Peter does fine at first. He goes and he steps out of the boat and he walks on the water towards Jesus. But then he takes his eyes away from Jesus. He takes his eyes off of Jesus. And he gets scared. He sees the winds and the waves, and he forgets the power of the one who stands before him. And that's when he starts to sink. When he looks away from Jesus, that's when he starts to sink. Peter let his fear get the best of him. There he was actually standing on this sea, walking towards the one who conquers chaos, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, of Miriam and Moses and Rahab, of Elijah. He's actually walking towards him on the water, and then he looks away, and he's afraid, and he starts to sink. He forgot who he was walking towards. He forgot to let the great I am be his focus and where he was headed, and that's when he started to sink. You see, we have that same Savior in our sights. The great I am beckons us to come, and we have him in our sights. As we go along in our lives, even if the wind picks up and the waves start to buffet us, Jesus is there. The great I am is there with us, standing on our chaos. He's there, walking over everything that's unruly and unpredictable in our lives, calling us to come. And all we have to do is keep our eyes on him. That's all we have to do, and we'll be okay. All we have to do is look at the one who conquers our chaos. This year, during Lent, maybe Jesus is calling us to give up our fear to keep our eyes on him instead of looking to the left or to the right and seeing the wind and waves. Instead, during Lent, just look to him. In Isaiah 43, verses 1 and 2, it says this, But now this is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you walk through the, through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. In other words, because God is God, we don't have to be afraid. Because God created us, because God formed us, because he is the great I am, he is Yahweh, we don't have reason to fear. All the things we fear are, in the end, distractions from him. They're real, yes, and perhaps they're legitimately terrifying, but ultimately they are distractions. When Peter was afraid, he looked to the left and to his right, and he saw the wind and the waves, and they were real. The wind and waves were there, and they were scary. They didn't go away just because Jesus was there. He had reason to be afraid. But the reason, with a capital R, to have courage was standing in front of him, calling him to come, so he didn't have to fear. The same is true for us now. There are reasons for us to be afraid. There might be reasons for us to be scared. We heard about some of them as we prayed this morning. There are 
Christians, brother, our brothers and sisters being killed around us in the world. There are friends who are sick and in pain. There are reasons to be scared. But what this story shows us this morning is that if we keep our eyes on Jesus, we'll be okay, even as all of that swirls around us. You'll notice in that passage in Isaiah, the promise isn't that we won't walk through the waters or the flames will never rise up. No, it's that God will be there when it happens. The promise isn't that we'll always be okay and free from trouble and worry, but that God will be there with us, and so we don't have to be afraid. Our chaos may be there, but the one who walks on that chaos is there too. I don't know what this looks like for you this morning. I don't know all the reasons you might have to fear in your life, in your situations this morning. But maybe for Lent this year, Christ wants us to give up that fear. Maybe for Lent this year, Christ wants us to keep our eyes fixed on him, keep walking towards him, and he'll help us through the chaos. Maybe that's God's call for us this Lent because he promised that we wouldn't be alone in the waters, that even when the flames were there, they wouldn't consume us, because he is the Lord our God. He is Yahweh, the great I am, our Savior. Amen.